My name is uh, Jagan Karapa. I'm a technical account manager within Google Cloud. Uh, I work with financial services customers primarily. And as a technical account manager, my job is to make sure that uh, my customers are happy with everything that happens on the cloud. I do this through a variety of different things. One of the things that I focus on is high performance computing. And today, we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means for uh, professional services, what that means for you. Hey, guys. I'm Eric, strategic cloud engineer, also working on financial services and high performance computing with Google Cloud. As part of the professional services organization, we do help our largest and most interesting customers and partners get there. So yeah. So. Before we get started, uh, we have a pretty good ad agenda planned for you today. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of flavor of what is Google Professional Services. Uh, we obviously go with an acronym called PSO. But the idea is uh, our mission is to get you, is to get, help you get the most out of Google products. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of announcements that come out from Google. There's a lot of things that you can potentially do, and there are a lot of different products you can use. Our job as professional services is to help you put together all these products in some sort of coherent story and uh, help you get the best out of the Google product system. Uh, I wanted to give you that flavor before we go in, but most of the session is going to cover a lot about how we can help you. Uh, in terms of agenda, we want to talk about five things today. One is why HPC on GCP. Two is how you can do this. We have some blueprints for you. Uh, three is then we're going to tell you how we can help you. We as professional services. And then we actually have a customer that we've done this with who's going to come up here and talk about their experience with us. Uh, and then we're also going to show you what exactly we did to the customer. So we have some folks here. Uh, well, our engagement leader is going to do this work. So it's, it'll be a fun session. We have about 50 minutes, so we'll go through as much as we can. And uh, please feel free to uh, ask your questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jagan. So first and foremost, why HPC and why do we run it on GCP? Well, you guys already know why you need to have HPC workloads. We're here to tell you why do you want it on GCP. But just a little bit of recap anyway. Compute needs are growing. And I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that it's growing in this way. Right? Here's a growth chart of the top 500 supercomputers with the sum of the list now exceeding one exaflop. And exascale systems are actually on their way. So while these are the leading systems, the rest of the HPC industry follows along with the same trends. And on the data side, not just compute side, right? With HPC, we also talk about data. <laughs> Big data, we've been using that term for a long time. 10 years ago, when we had three petabyte capacity systems, we called that Big Data. Now we're at 250 petabyte capacity systems 10 years later, and we're still calling that Big Data. So Big Data is actually bigger than big. And the third variable in all this, it's also expensive. Look at all those numbers on that timeline on the left side. And running on-prem, we also have that limitation of how we can consume. The time that we need our workloads to run and be processed is not really predictable. Sometimes it's bursty. And with on-prem, you're at with 100%, we're really forced to wait when we get to this area. Right? If I run out of compute and I have to put more things in, I have to wait until it's, av it's available. And when I don't have a lot of things to run, I'm wasting money because I still have to pay for that power to run my on-prem systems. So running it in the cloud um, is a pretty good idea in our opinion. But what are the, th what are the key differentiators for, for Google and why do we want to run on Google? Compute, storage, and networking, those three main things. On the compute side of things, um, as you guys all probably know, how many of you know that we have what we call preemptible VMs? Right? These are VMs that we haven't sold yet, and we're like, well, they're sitting there anyway. Why don't we give it to you at a discount? Right? They're super low cost, and they're short-term instances. And in order to make sure that you don't use those VMs, those preemptible VMs, in a, in a bad way, we actually say, you know what? We're going to preempt them at least once every day. Right? This way you don't get used to having preemptible VMs running long term, and then all of a sudden they go away. But what's coming up? What's new? We do have some new VM families that are available in EAP, and that's compute-optimized VMs. Anyone interested in Cascade Lake processors? 3.8 gigahertz, right? That's coming in compute-optimized VMs. You just heard that announced during Next today. Um, we have memory-optimized VMs. This way, we can actually have 6 terabyte and 12 terabyte memory 
attached to, to VMs and, and your processing nodes. So this is the exciting part of what's coming. So if we look at across the board of what we've already brought a while ago, custom machine types, what we brought a while ago, right? Preemptible VMs, quick point-to-point VM-to-VM networks. And tomorrow we are bringing compute optimized VMs. We're bringing native job scheduler integrations, sole tenant nodes for those chatty workloads that you have, and most importantly, bringing all of this from VM clusters to Kubernetes. All of this is coming technology. Storage is also a thing, right? Most of the time when you are uh, running on-prem, you're talking about different data stores. They typically evolve around a shared file system or other, like, um, what else is there? What else do you guys run on-prem on for, for storage? Luster, Elastifile. We are partnering with all of these different uh, vendors out there, storage vendors, to bring you a good storage ecosystem as well. And later we'll see a whole slide of those partners. And last but not least, the network on, on GCP. We have a fast network, right? We have um, terabit cross-section, 16 terabit cross-section network bandwidth inside our data centers. And you can actually have up to 7,000 VMs per HPC, for v, per VPC. There's predictable latency across any node across the globe. And each VM can actually take advantage of 16 gigabits of throughput. So this is our ecosystem, right? Between storage, workload managers, HPC applications, and solutions integrators that can help you get your workload there. I believe HPC on GCP is the way to go. Feel free to take a picture of this as well for a link to any of the other sessions that are HPC related here at Next 2019. <laughs> So now we know why, but how? How do we do it? Well, what are some of the blueprints that we have? What are the common patterns that we see HPC customers using on GCP? You can burst to cloud, you can do auto-scaling, right? Um, I don't always need to have a static cluster of a certain size. And if I am streaming input to my workload, I can actually have that cluster grow and shrink as needed. So I am paying for only the compute that I need and not a cent more. We can actually also federate your compute workload to the cloud only. Running in this way over VPN or interconnects, you can actually have your schedulers and your worker nodes on-prem, and only when, you, when your on-prem hardware is exhausted and you need to go faster, do we need to go to the cloud. So this is another pattern that we see. So putting it all together, we have a lot of things here. Right, number one, we see external feeds and cloud pub sub as an example of a streaming input to cloud storage. And cloud storage is a product where we really stage all the inputs and the big data to be used in these, in these jobs. That goes into your HPC farm, right? On Compute Engine, you can actually have GPUs, TPUs, as well as CPUs. And this is the part that we're talking about. This is the part that can scale up and down and run compute optimized, et cetera. The rest of the, of the diagram that you see here are really integrations with other things. So if you, look at, if you take a look at number four, after the HPC farm processes everything and it puts it back into a big storage area, we're gonna once again make use of Google Cloud Storage. And from there you can actually hook that up to BigQuery, put that in archival storage and code line, use that to train ML models and TensorFlow. When you run HPC on GCP, the entire ecosystem opens to you. And that's what we're talking about. With that said, how can we help you get there? Thanks, Eric. Uh, so, as you saw in the last slide, that we have a lot of products, and I had mentioned that earlier on, that uh, the Google ecosystem is constantly growing. Uh, it's great, and it's also challenging in the perspective that you have to learn a lot of new things on the fly, at, at basically at all times, which is a good thing. But when you try to build a solution, it sort of like gets overwhelming. So, we at Google Professional Services sort of believe in like building with you. The idea is that our HPC SMEs uh, some of them are with you right now, uh, our consultant who you're gonna hear from, and cloud engineers like Eric himself, we will work with you to build this out. Uh, the idea is not like other consulting firms wherein we just come in and we just do stuff and go away. 
we believe in this thing called crawl, walk, run. It's a, it's a well understood term in the industry. Uh, but basically the idea is like pace yourself as opposed to try to do, everybody wants to do something radical, everybody wants to do something really cool and innovative, but we want to try to get something practical done first, and then you sort of go to the next step. So from an SPC perspective, what we've done with other customers where we've been quite successful is, first we come in and we do some sort of questionnaire and we work with your engineers, your HPC engineers, to understand the current state. What batch schedulers do you have? What storage systems do you use? Then we try to understand what that means, like what do you want to change in the six months? Uh, then we develop a target state for you. Uh, and then we actually work with you to build a proof of concept. Uh, this is a pretty interesting exercise, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about it in the next slide. But it's when Google engineers actually sit down with your HPC staff and your business folks, and we work with you to deploy your workload on GCP. How to set up the network, how to, do, uh, how to configure IAM policies. There's a whole bunch of the stuff that has to happen which we're gonna help you with. The second piece is when you walk. Now that we have, you know the POC and you have confidence in it, what you're really looking to do is to actually deploy this. So we have, Google can, professional services can help, but we have a whole bunch of partners like ROs and GFD, There's a, in the slide you saw that, who'll actually do this work for you if you don't have the bandwidth to do this. Typically we've seen customers go either ways. If you wanna do it, great. If you don't wanna do it, then we have partners. We can do it either ways. Uh, and then the final state is run. And this is where it gets really exciting for customers is now, now that you are in the cloud and you have this deployed, how do you make the best use of the cloud? So the architecture that Eric was showing you about is cloud native, but that's basically the power of the cloud is like you get to try all these new products. So with that, today we are launching a new service. Uh, we call it the first part of the journey, uh, the crawl part of the journey. Uh, it's called Cloud Discover HPC. Uh, this is a service offering that we have been piloting for the last one year. Uh, we've been fairly successful at it. Uh, we've done it with a financial services firm that you'll hear from. We've done it with a healthcare firm. We're doing it with another big healthcare firm next week, and we've done it with 3EDU. We've done about like 78 of these, uh, some with us, some with our partners. We've gotten pretty good at it, I would think. Uh, the idea is that in the very first week, what we're doing is um, we do some prep work before we get on the ground to understand what your workload looks like and all that good stuff. Then we actually do a whiteboarding set, then we come on site on a three-day effort wherein we sit down with you, we do whiteboarding exercises to figure out what the target state is, and as soon as you do that, we're actually in code development mode. We're actually getting our hands dirty with your staff, and the idea is that we want to leave the, in three days, we want to build a POC. And also, like it's not like we do the work and you sit out of the room, we are actually sitting with you, and the idea is like we want to teach you how to do this as opposed to us to do this. Once this is done, we go back, we understand what's been done so far, then we put together a technical design document, uh, which is essentially a plan which says, okay, now that this is the POC, how do you take this POC and how do you take it to the next level? Uh, it's a pretty good exercise because what we've seen customers do is uh, they get their hands dirty with GCP and all the different product sets out there, as opposed to just being like a, a bunch of slides. Uh, and the second thing is you work, get to work with uh, real life stuff, which is always exciting. Uh, I just described this to you, but just to go back on that, week zero is very much around like pre preparation. Uh, week one is planning, uh, and then week two is design for future. One thing I definitely want to call out is we've had a lot of customers do this, and the, the part that really excites them is that when the business comes up with a use case, let's say uh, war calculations are getting slower, we need more capacity, whatever it is, this is a great opportunity for your IT to get involved as well. And we actually sit with your IT. And in a lot of enterprise organizations, the business and IT are two separate, I, I don't want to say silos, but they're two different organizations with two different priorities, right? So this is one area where the business has said something, and within five days, you can sort of say, hey, we built a POC, this works, or this doesn't, hopefully it works, and, and we can say that, okay, now what? So I know I've said a lot about how good we are. I think it's, it'll be helpful for you to hear from our, one of our first customers. Uh, so I'd like to call on stage Naveed Malik. He's the head of data for Cubis Systematic. Uh, he was one of our first customers, and uh, Naveed will share all the good and the bad that we had. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Jagan. 
First of all, there are glaring lights in front of me, so if I'm not looking at you, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just um, trying to avoid the lights. Sorry. Okay, so starting with the high level overview of our company, uh, Cupis Systematic is the trading division of Point72. And Point72 is one of the legendary hedge funds founded by Steve Cohen in, in 1992. Uh, the systematic business was started early 2000s. And, and that is the systematic business is now called Cubist. <coughs> so when we talk about data, uh, any hedge fund typically uses a lot of data, but specifically the systematic hedge funds, which are other names are like black box trading or whatever you call it, uh, or quantitative trading, uh, they use massive amounts of data uh, because they need this data to run their trading strategies uh, because these are 100% automated systems. Uh, we started thinking about HPC a few years ago. Uh, at that time, Google Cloud or HPC, Google HPC environment was not at that level. We tried a few other options, which is kind of out of scope for today's discussion. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about kind of where we kind of went and how we set it up. So in general, kind of any data processing problem, first of all, it is going to be I.O. bound. So a lot of people kind of made the mistake of throwing a lot of cores at it. It's not going to solve the problem. Because if you are I.O. bound, first you need to uh, solve the I.O. problem, uh, I.O. and network. So the way we solve the problem uh, is by building an in-house HPC environment, uh, which, was, uh, which use, utilizes a cluster-based solution uh, using cheap magnetic disks uh, with SSDs um, for metadata and connected to, uh, through the um, InfiniBand fabric to, to compute nodes. And compute nodes are running uh, Condor Grid. So this environment works pretty neat um, for our requirements. And actually, at that time, when we were building this environment uh, about three years ago, uh, we knew there are going to be some bursty workloads. We thought, OK, it will take us a week to, from time to time to run, to run through those bursty workloads. But for sustained workloads, the in-house HPC was, uh, was enough. And uh, sustained workloads are what we had to do day in and day out. Uh, in terms of processing the data, as well as delivering the data to the clients. And, and I'll have a little bit more detail on that. So question is, why did we go for, or why did we choose Google Cloud? And actually, even more fundamental question is, why did we choose to go for cloud? So as I mentioned earlier, the in-house HPC solution works great for our sustained workloads. But the worst workloads that we thought are going to be occasional actually turned out to be a lot more frequent. Um, happens maybe once a week, a few times a month, uh, where we have to go through some massive amount of data processing. Um, and that creates a problem for us, because in that time, uh, first of all, the users are waiting. Uh, if a user has to wait for, say, seven days to get their data, uh, that is an opportunity lost. They could have done something else during that time. So to deal with those situations, um, we, we considered other options. Uh, and then uh, we decided to run a kind of complete POC after getting an overview of um, storage and network and compute resources provided by Google. Uh, so that is. <coughs> Sorry. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we are talking about HPC environments, there are a few fundamental components that you have to worry about. Uh, storage and network are the most important one. And I'm talking about HPC for data processing. There might be other situations where you just need compute and you're good with it. Uh, but for data processing workloads, you need to have good storage, which can keep up, which can supply enough data to your nodes, and network, which can kind of deliver the data. And compute, obviously. Um, but there are two additional components which uh, we, you know, we were very conscious about, and I'm sure a lot of you are going to be conscious, are the cost and support. So 
cost kind of it's a kind of a lot of people think that cloud is cheap but if you don't use it kind of in a in a sensible way it can become very expensive so we were very kind of cautious about the about the cost we wanted to be sure first of all what's the storage is how the storage is going to perform how is the network going to be uh, what are the costs for the compute and overall what is the cost going to be and support that's in any kind of compute environment you want to have very good support so speaking of support um, as uh, jagan mentioned earlier uh, this pso organization was great it is a fantastic team of engineers and, and developers and gabriel um, with his in his leadership he brought together a really good team which helped us uh, set up this environment so now i'll go a little bit into more detail on the the application or the problem we chose for testing the google uh, hpc environment so uh, we chose to use one of the uh, kind of problems which is level 2 data processing and specifically we chose a cme um, this was just one of the more established ones so we wanted to try that one uh, in a depth of book processing uh, you get massive amount of data in terms of updates to the book and every update to the book results in change of the state of the book uh, and more importantly every message has to be processed in a particular sequence so you have the option to first logical thing is maybe save the state of the book every every time there is a change the problem is there are large number of instruments and every instrument can take tens or hundreds of times every millisecond so if you try to save the book state at every update it will result in gigantic amount of data and there's nothing wrong with gigantic amount of data problem is to retrieve it it's going to be counterproductive uh, in this case cme is a 50 gigabyte compressed messages uh, not the book state so compressed messages every day and we had to go through 12 years of history so what was the business objective of this particular application uh, business objective is to be able to deliver book state for any given instrument at any given point in time in history so as i mentioned the messages have to be processed in processed in a sequence from the opening time to the point in time the user needs it so it is very expensive to go through the whole days of messages to to build the state of that time uh, for the given point in time so what we did is we ran through the 12 years of history saved a snapshot of the book every uh, minute boundary and have an api which you which recreates the book at any given point in time so if the user requests uh, for an instrument abc i need data as of this time time stamp uh, so the book state as of this time stamp it finds the previous uh, minute snapshot and applies the messages during that minute and builds the builds and delivers the state it does a lot more other things also which kind of are out of scope for this discussion so during this uh, result was uh, we were able to successfully duplicate our environment in in google and not only duplicate we were able to test the scalability also as i mentioned earlier in the slides uh, first challenge is always to kind of for data processing think about storage and and network we were okay with that uh, and then the problem that we were having of uh, being able to scale up and down on demand that was resolved so it was overall and we tested by spinning up 400 compute nodes uh, in house we are any time we are running from 20 to 30 nodes and and we did some experimentation and there is some additional experiments going on in terms of how much we can push it um, can we run 1000 2000 and how does the performance scale as uh, like with any successful test uh, a good customer service is uh, service would ask for feedback and jagan and gabriel asked me kind of definitely put what should we improve what we could have done better 
So as I mentioned, for, uh, for any client, cost is definitely one of the factors to worry about. And especially with the preemptables, that's a great idea. I love the idea. The problem is it's hard to tell how many preemptables are going to be available at any given time. So calculating costs becomes a much more complicated problem. Uh, you can hope that it's going to be low cost because of preemptables, but you don't have an idea what it is going to be. So coming from a quantitative background, uh, if my suggestion is to make the, either the history available or just use the history, run some ML techniques on top of it to kind of predict how many preemptables are going to get utilized for a given problem. So during the PSC, we actually had to run the batches uh, to see the actual cost, like after running it, instead of trying to kind of estimate it ahead of time. Uh, although, kudos to Google for providing the, kind of an excellent dashboard for looking at what the cost is, um, where the cost came from, where it came from storage, or from network, or from, from compute. And just so you know, the, most of the cost was coming from storage because we, we wanted a very high throughput storage. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. By the way, I'm around. If anybody has questions, actually, we have a question and answer session at the end. I just wanted to mention um, I am leading this Cubist data services group uh, and um, looking for good data scientists, software developers. We are not looking for hedge fund expertise. Somebody is, is a good C++ developer. We are definitely looking for them, uh, So Python, and so on. Uh, and not only my group, there are many groups within, within our organization who are looking for good technologists. We are competing with Google, Google for talent. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you are interested in kind of, looking, uh, kind of working on kind of staying in the technology, working on high tech area, and at the same time, uh, kind of learning about financial industry, uh, there is an email address here, cubistalent at cubistsystematic.com. And, and also, you can look my contact up from the speaker profile. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Gabriel, who I mentioned was the lead cloud consultant and PSO. Uh, he was instrumental in making it a success. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Navid. I'm, I'm okay. back. Uh, no. All right, can we switch to the demo? All right, thanks a lot. All right, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to show you how to deploy an HD Condor uh, batch scheduler in GCP. So HD Condor is uh, the batch scheduler that uh, we deployed at uh, Cubist. As I said, it was a good example to, uh, to show you. Uh, it's not the only scheduler that we support in GCP. There is a Slurm, a PBS, there is a whole bunch. Um, what we will be doing now, I will show you how to deploy this uh, using Google Deployment Manager scripts. So I'll show you where to get these scripts, how to launch them, and then uh, the scripts will deploy a, a, what we call a submit host, where you can log in and submit your jobs. There will be a central manager that will be used uh, uh, to coordinate and match uh, the jobs into the resources. Um, once I showed you how to deploy the cluster, I will show you how to set up auto-scaling for your cluster with a solution that will uh, bring up nodes or down depending on the number of jobs that are available in the queue. So let's start. First thing, I'm going to get some software. So I'll start from here. Uh, it's a, a software that you can find in GitHub, uh, GCP, and HD Condor. So these are the three words that you need to find the software. And look here, I'm feeling lucky. And the first hit is my software. Now, everything that I'm going to show you is actually explained in, in here. So you can actually redo it yourself. But of course, I'm going to show you now. Um, to get the software, so this is GitHub, you can go to um, the repository, you can say clone, copy the GitHub link into your, um, 
uh, memory. And then you can say git clone and here. Uh, this will bring the software into your cloud shell environment. I'm showing you my cloud shell environment. I created a project um, called HD Condor Demo to do that. And then, of course, since this is a demo, I have already downloaded it. And so I can go to where the code is. So this is the software that we're going to use to provision the resources and then uh, run startup scripts that will install HD Condor in the nodes. Um, this uh, is the main piece of software that you need to configure to change the configuration of, uh, um, of your uh, cluster. It's uh, the Condor cluster YAML. So this is the list of files that you have. This is what you want to change. And you know the, the parameters are, are these ones. You have uh, uh, the number of nodes that you want to have statically allocated then you can scale them up and down. Uh, the type of resources that you want to provision, uh, in this case I'm provisioning nodes with four calls each, a CentOS, and then Condor version 881, which is the latest. I know this demo works with this. Um, if you don't specify the version, you get the latest one. So let's get down to it. So to kick it off, you use this command, which is also explained in the instructions as I was showing it to you before. And this will take the configuration from YAML that we just changed and deploy the resources. You can see what Google Cloud is doing by going into your console. And uh, uh, as you can see, the deployment manager is actually working to deploy our resources. You can see the details of the resources that you are provisioning here. Uh, now we are deploying a network, and as the network is deployed, we'll create some firewall rules to allow uh, communication between uh, the demons on, uh, on the nodes that we install. Uh, as I mentioned, there is going to be a master, a submit node, and then a bunch of computer resources. So while we wait for this uh, to spin up, let me tell you a bit more about uh, uh, you know, what, what this is, right? So I went fast over this before. Um, the two nodes that we are deploying is the submit and, and central manager. But the compute nodes we will deploy using what we call a managed instance group. Now, a managed instance group is a resource uh, in GCP that uh, gives you the ability of uh, uh, creating multiple identical resources. And so it provides an interface, an API, that allows you to um, specify how many nodes of that kind you want, and automatically it will bring it up and down. I mean, manage this as group also do other things like rolling updates and you know more 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 than what I'm just telling you. But you know, for this demo, we are only using those those APIs. Um, so. Managed instance group is what we are using to actually implement our autoscaler. So our autoscaler, I can tell you more now about that while we wait for, for this to come up. Well, the deployment has finished successfully now. You see that all of this is, is up. If you go and look at your VMs, you see them all here. Um, what's happening now inside the VMs, uh, um, a startup script is running which is installing HT Condor. So let me tell you a bit more about the autoscaler while we wait for this to install. It takes about a couple of minutes, okay? And this is also a measure of uh, how long you have to wait when you bring up new resources. So you autoscale up, you submit more jobs, you autoscale resources up. In a couple of minutes, they are available to run your jobs. So how do you scale them up? You can go back to the same page as we were before, there is a directory called Autoscaler. If you click here, there is a bunch of instructions on how to set this up. So you can do that yourself. I'll show you how to do it. Um, what we are doing, uh, we have uh, a um, Python uh, software that is uh, called Autoscaler, not surprisingly, which has accept a uh, whole bunch of uh, different arguments documented here. What we want to do, we want to go on a node. In this case, we'll use the submit node. 
and uh, uh, install the software there, and then call the autoscaler with the appropriate, uh, with the appropriate parameters here. So let's uh, go to the deployment, let's see if it has finished, and then I'll show you how to install the autoscaler. So to go to the submit node, you can click on the SSH button, bring up another one in case I need it. So what's happening now, uh, the system is transferring keys so that, uh, uh, to, to the machines so that then I can actually log into the machines using SSH. So this is the terminal. Let me make it a bit bigger. Okay, so So what you see here is that uh, we have no jobs currently on the system. Um, nothing is in the queue. And uh, that uh, some nodes are started to become available to, to report to it. So what I want to do, in principle, if I submit jobs, uh, these resources will be able to run the, the jobs for us. What I want to show you now is how to install the autoscaler. So, First, I need git. Let me install git. All right. And now the directory that you want is in the same repo that I showed before. So you git clone this. Okay, this is the same uh, direct the repository that I have uh, installed in my Cloud Shell before. Um, now let's go to the autoscaler. You want to run this, uh, uh, this program and uh, what it will do since uh, uh, there is no job in the queue and there are resources in, uh, uh, available to run jobs, um, if I run the autoscaler now, it will say, well, I don't need all these resources. Let me, let me turn them off. So let me cut and paste this command here. Oops, this is the one that I did not want. I opened. In case I, I needed it, I, I don't think I need it. All right, let's see. The project name, as I said before, is HD Condor Demo, and all the other parameters are fine. Now I'm using Verbosity 1. What happens is that uh, the system will see that there are more machines than jobs, and it will, uh, it will try to bring them down. Now, one thing that we can do we can submit uh, more jobs. I have some example jobs here, applications. Uh, this is a simple uh, piece of C code that calculates the first n prime numbers, just as a way to use CPU and waste it. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the Condor submit file. This is the Condor submit files that uh, um, specifies uh, how to run the, uh, the program. So the executable is prime. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah, let's calculate the first 400,000 prime numbers. We don't have anything better to do. And so let me run 12 of those. All right, so I can submit it. All right, so I have no resources now, but I have 12 idle jobs. So let me run the resources with the autoscaler. Let me scale them up. All right, so what's happening is that uh, I'm running, um, I'm 
I have 12 jobs idle in the queue. Um, I need to bring up three resources to actually run these. And so what happening is that, you know, there are more resources that are being brought up because, uh, you know, I need to run them. All right, very good. Uh, rather than waiting until all of this is, is brought up, two minutes, et cetera, um, let me summarize what I've told you, right? So we have deployed uh, an HT Condor system in, uh, well, about 10 to 12 minutes uh, in, in GCP. Um, I showed you where to get the software. You have to Google GitHub GCP HT Condor, unsurprisingly. Uh, you find the Google Deployment Manager scripts there. You can go to your cloud shell and uh, git clone that repository. If you go into the HT Condor context, you can edit the parameters of your, con of your Condor cluster and then launch the deployment manager so that you get uh, your uh, resources up here. Once you have your resources up, you can use the cluster that way, or if you want to auto-scale it up and down, like we recommend, then you can go to the same one of the nodes. The submit node is, is a good one and then you git clone the same repo, and then you can put the autoscaler in an automated execution fashion. Typically, we recommend to put that as a, a cron job. Maybe every five minutes you can check, or every two minutes, depending on your requirements, and automatically that will bring up and down the resources as you need. And with this, I finish my demo. <laughs>